Welcome to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. I'm joined today by my guest, Jesus Rodriguez, who is the Council General for Venezuela in Chicago. Uh, thank, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting uh, us. Thank you for joining us. Um, a little background uh, before we start here. Um, uh, Jesus has uh, taught international foreign trade in Venezuela, and he uh, was an advisor for the Ministry of Housing. And uh, he's been Council General in Chicago since 2008. Uh, and he was involved in the birth of uh, an organization of the alternative media movement in Venezuela. I thought we might start by asking you about that. What is the alternative media in uh, Venezuela? Yes, that happened. At least my involvement in that moment. That moment is, I mean, was appears in Venezuela before my involvement, but I started getting involved in that movement since 2002 when the coup against Hugo Chavez happened. Okay. Um, and because of that and because the media didn't, didn't the mass media in Venezuela didn't cover, the, the one that is controlled by private corporations, didn't cover properly that yeah. coup d'etat. A lot of Venezuelans felt like compelled to do something to fix that. And because of that, during that time, uh, there was this movement was like created to try to build websites and radio, community radio stations, and also local TV stations, community TV stations that will provide access to another kind of information to Venezuelans besides the information that the traditional corporate media right. uh, usually broadcast. So basically that's somehow right. how I get involved in that movement. So um, in the United States, we, you know, we, we sort of uh, feel that um, because it's all commercial it's, and it's market driven, mm -hmm. that, um, that people are getting all sides of the issue uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the private um, for-profit media outlets. But, um, you know, there are those who feel that those private outlets all have something in common, mm -hmm. and therefore um, they're going to cover things in, particularly in a certain way, and they're go even though there's a lot of freedom for them to cover whatever they want, uh, at the end of the day, they're pretty much covering everything the same way. So, so in, in some other countries, I'm aware of this, uh, the government um, actually ensures that there will be a variety of voices by actually providing mm. airtime for community groups uh, to broadcast uh, and put up their own programming. And is that is that sort yes. of what we're talking about in Venezuela? That happened here? in Venezuela, but even even in, in, in the case of Venezuela, we don't even need at that moment at least the 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 back of the government because the government was already very stressed uh, trying to deal with a coup d'etat. Yeah. So basically it was a citizen movement like that. Like, so this like started a, with the, with yes, the people then? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So that, from that perspective, I believe that is even nicer in the case yeah. of the, what we did in Venezuela, trying to build uh, radios and, and websites uh, that provide an alternative coverage about what happened in Venezuela because during the coup d'etat, the main TV channels in Venezuela were broadcasting cartoons and Tom and Jerry and yeah. things like that. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's amusing. This is sort of a complaint everywhere. I remember in, uh, in the United States when the, uh, I, I grew up in a small town, Joliet, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, we, I was in high school and, you know, we were protesting the war in Vietnam and the newspaper ran an editorial every day saying, we need a lake in Joliet. And we thought, the, you know, the world is falling apart here. Yes. And this newspaper is uh, talking about, you know, building a lake uh, so they can go boating. Um, so um, for those of us that aren't familiar with Venezuelan history, what was going on at that time? Who, who were the winners? Who were the losers in that time? Yes, yes. That's, that was a particular very crucial time in Venezuelan recent history because, yeah. I mean, President Hugo Chavez was elected in 1998. Okay. Uh, uh, because of an electoral process in which he won against the candidate that was selected by all the traditional Venezuelan parties. Yeah. 
uh, and uh, in 2002. So because his election was more of a people's movement. Uh, more something yes, like that. Okay, yes, yes, something okay. like that. He didn't belong to the traditional. Yeah, he Venezuela. was the Bernie Sanders in your election. Process. Something yeah. like that. But he yeah. Bernie belongs to the Democratic Party, and Chavez didn't belong to the traditional yeah, status yeah. quo party. So in that yeah. sense, he was different. Well, Bernie was an independent for many years. For yes. I, yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, yes, that happened in Venezuela in 2000. Two because Hugo Chavez didn't respond to the input of the status quo, the the fourth power in Venezuela or the the factical powers of Venezuela. They decided to promote a coup d'état in 2002, and they actually got him out of office like for two days. Okay. But then, because of the people going into the streets, I mean, and, and because of the pressure of the people in front of uh, military uh, forts, yeah. uh, somehow the people press the military to reverse the decision. And that's something that I believe that haven't happened very often in world history. In, uh, in recent so, uh, memory here. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I, I never hear of something like that happening, and I believe that that's very powerful. And and that inspired a lot of Venezuelans that were like, I was a, a media believer for all my life. I, I believe that I read news, I started reading newspapers and I was 10 yeah. with my father, and he yeah. told me to believe in newspapers, but always with a critic perspective. Sure. But I still was a believer of the media in 2002, but uh, until 2002. But after that, that was a big crash inside me because I realized that everything that I saw the media was for was not exactly as I saw. So that's yeah. why. Yeah. You start doing something by yourself, so trying to build a different alternative access to people, to media, yeah. giving voice to people that are usually not, yeah. uh, don't have access to express themselves. Sure. So that's part of the. Well, so in the United States, we have uh, public radio and we have the public broadcasting system mm -hmm. um, on television. Um, but that's a very small portion of our program, especially when you consider you know, all of the cable options. What what yes. percentage, um, how, how are you split up in Venezuela percentage-wise? What's that look yes, like? Yes, even though that since 2002 the government has been promoting and backing yeah. the alternative media movement yeah. from Venezuela, the community media, uh, I believe that the private, at least when we talk about yeah. TV stations, I believe that the share of the private TV stations yeah. is like, there are like two, like three big TV corporations are like 60 or 70 percent. I believe that should be around 70 oh, well, and 80 yeah, percent. Yeah. So the, the biggest share of the yeah. TV is in hands of uh, private corporations. Yeah. Disregarding all the four. But you still have a, a much greater portion uh, devoted to, um, um, what do you call it, uh, you know, um, the community media, yeah, community alternative, based alternative broadcasting. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And what do they do? Do they do? Uh, are they news shows? Are they talk shows? Do they mostly talk they do shows? They sitcoms. Music. Could my neighborhood do a sitcom if we were doing? I this? don't know what <laughs> the sitcom. Well, it's all oh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a silly English. comedy in the United States. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I don't love get Lucy. It. You know, that kind they of do. Stuff, they yeah. they also. Yeah. I mean, we also approve uh, after 2002 a law that promote the creation of uh, national producers and. That that incentivate a lot uh, the the, produ uh, the creation of new content in Venezuela. Yeah. So they some some of those outlets use uh, that to try to 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 empower more the people. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can find a lot of uh, like a variety of you you can have find actually sport. Uh, radio stations. I mean, you find a lot of things, but the 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 the, the scene related to community. In the case of the Venezuela, I mean, according to Venezuelan legislation, uh, they, I mean, they, when we talk about community radio, community TV yeah. stations, they they have a limit, limited geographical 
area in which they can operate. Yeah. So that that doesn't. That's why when we talk about sh the share of the of those channels in comparison with the the, yeah. the, the, the big corporate corporate ones, I mean, it's too low. Yeah. Uh, but we also have radio. I mean, and, and radio in Venezuela is in, uh, is enhanced also like in ninety percent of private corporations yeah. and newspapers is like like 99 yeah. percent in hands of well, private this is, corporations this is the too. same thing that happened in the united states in the last uh, 30 years you know we used to have little local radio stations everywhere and local newspapers and they're increasingly getting bought up by larger and larger uh, corporations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you get you know just one broadcast uh, you know uh, being picked up on a lot of different stations um, so, do you see much of a difference here in the U.S. then, in terms of the the? It's more complex because the U.S. is a big country geographically talking, mm -hmm. and I believe that somehow that affects how you organize in order to yeah to to produce content locally and nationally. So we in Venezuela don't have those that differentiation between local news and national so news. So you actually see so more different, more, more um, of a diffused, uh, differentiated broadcast here than you, uh, you see more variety here than you see at home? No, I, I, I believe that less? the only variety that I see is the one related to local content. Yeah, that, okay. that That I believe that is connected to to what I was telling you, that yeah. that differentiation between local news and, and national news. But when yeah. you go to the main context, I mean, I believe that it is always the same. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I yeah. don't, I don't, I don't see that in, in Venezuela, at least from the perspective of what you see in the private corporations. I mean, yeah. you see basically the same thing that you yeah. see here. Yeah. So. So here um, we're getting a lot of coverage of the election that's coming up. Mm. Um, and of the uh, the bombings in uh, in Europe are those the same kinds of things you're, you would expect to see at home? We see same, yeah. the same thing in Venezuela. Yeah, uh, it's broadcast. The good thing is that at least the public uh, media, the one that is under government control, and they present a, a critic perspective, and that's that happened especially more in in an intense way after the coup that's against yeah. Chavez in 2002, and we we present a critical approach yeah. to the news that you usually see on yeah. on the yeah. corporate media. Yeah, that's interesting because here I think, um, you know, most of it's um, an attempt at objectivity, uh, sometimes more or less, but um, um, any variation from that usually is more of a comedy approach to it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a parody or something. But you, so what you have in Venezuela is what we might think of as an editorial in the newspaper. You've got more editorializing yes. uh, on the uh, on the electronic side. That happened. That that's, happened. That's very interesting. One thing that I have to highlight is also yeah. is that in like in 2005 we created Telesur, which is a is a is a very powerful tool that right now is helping us to present outside Venezuela information not only from Venezuela but from Latin America with the progressive perspective which is the, 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 pro, the perspective that we try to promote. Okay, very good. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. The Calumet Roundtable will be right back. Welcome back to the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. My guest today is Jesus Rodriguez, and we're continuing our discussion about Venezuela, the media, and the United States. Um, so um, there's been a lot of political unrest in Venezuela since 2014. Can yes. you talk about that a little bit for us? Yes, a little bit. It's going to be like too short. 
Okay. For all the scenes that we have been passing through the last decade. But yes, I mean, after Chavez's death in 2013, I believe that there was this perception in conservative factors yeah. around the world that saw that the Bolivarian Revolution and the socialist movement in Venezuela was going to disappear. And, and they has been if doing If I just interject for a second. So um, uh, Jesus was the um, uh, consulate general in, in Chicago from Venezuela since 2008. So you were yes. in Chicago while all of this was going on, yes, right? So yes, this gives yes, you an interesting yes, perspective. Yes. So please go ahead. Yeah. That's true, that's true. Yes. I have a, a very good yeah. overview of, on how the, the, the situation in Venezuela has evolved and also how the U.S. approached yes, you were and, here. and yes. portrayed or, or somehow um, yeah. show to the world what happened in Venezuela. So yes, in, 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 in 2014 the situation was, got worsening because um, there were like protests in the country against President Maduro, which is the the, the president that that President Chavez, the candidate that President Chavez uh, asked Chavista forces to support. Yeah, and he won the election in two thousand in two thousand thirteen in April two thousand thirteen, but uh, by a small margin. He won like by two percent of difference with the yeah. other candidate from the right wing. So, so that gave them the the idea that they were going, they were about to retake the country. And we had regional elections, elections for governors that same year in December. But in that in that election, the Chavista forces retake control of a lot of uh, uh, states in I Venezuela. That, yeah. And we won like with a margin bigger than 10%. Yeah. And I believe that they start getting desperate because of that. And then in, in February, March 2014, we have what we call Guarimbas, which is not anything different than terrorist acts and riots promoted by right-wing forces in Venezuela. But they were portrayed here in the US like peaceful student protest. Uh, this was the February 12th Youth Day they yes. started in February 2014. Yes, that's true. Okay. That's right. true. And and because of that, I mean, uh, I believe that the the the, the public relation on Venezuela in the U.S. got worse and worse because they portray us like the ones being uh, violators of human rights when what was happening was the contrary. I mean, there yeah. was this movement not of the students but of the students and paramilitary groups that were trying to create like the conditions similar to the conditions of what happened in Ukraine that was that also yeah. happened almost at the same time. Yeah, and there's also some you know some interesting observations about how we've been reporting Ukraine as well because yes. um, the the, uh, the the party in power uh, actually was um, uh, was not uh, the elected party either, right? But mm -hmm. um, but anyway, mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, but in in the case yeah. of Venezuela, I mean that people were trying to oust President Maduro, yeah, and that was the idea, and they call it la salida, the, the exit. I mean to get rid of President Maduro, yeah. and 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 the truth is that during those days, like around forty Venezuelans died. Yeah. And and out of yeah. those 40, 43, Venezuela, yeah, yeah. yes, more than, more than 40, yes. Uh, and out of those 40 something people that died, uh, like seven, like, like, like 17, I believe, of them were like policemen, law enforcement people. Yeah. Killed by peaceful by the protesters. Yeah. protesters. Uh, and uh, like, 10 or 13 more of them were like just past buyers, bystanders. Uh, bystanders. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and people that didn't have anything to do with the Chavismo or the, yeah. the right wingers. Uh, and, uh, and then they were like around 10 people that, that died also that belonged to the right wing groups. Yeah. So that gives you an idea of how they distort, because here the news presented like Venezuelan government because of the repression killed 40 people, but 
you know, yeah. in order to say that we are violators of human rights, and I, I always do, and I talk whenever they ask me to talk, I always say that there's nothing more far from the truth that we are violators of human rights. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, whatever we have been doing in Venezuela in recent years is very far of uh, not respecting human rights has yeah. been the contrary. We have been trying to empower the Venezuelan people, the, the majority of the Venezuelan, to have human rights that before the revolution were denied to them by the traditional political parties that controlled the country since 1958. Yeah. So it's it complex. seems um, um, odd to me that the students were aligned the way they were in that. Um, that, that's sort of unusual. What was the connection between what the, the students were? The students you said the, the mm -hmm. university students were mm -hmm. aligned with the um, with the protest. With the, yeah, I, I mean, what was their the, connection? The beginning, that? the the beginning of the protest was. I, I mean, there were a lot of Venezuelans that that reasonably were protesting against the government, and that's absolutely legitimate. The problem is that that derived at some point into terrorist acts and, and acts of sabotage, they burn buildings, they yeah. close the streets, they don't allow people to get out of their neighborhoods. They start to, and, and whomever wanted to uh, clean up a barricade that they put in the streets, I yeah. mean, uh, was shoot or, or beaten or something like that. So, yeah. so that's what, and, and yeah. that's the moment in which the government uh, act in a very strong way, I believe, but I believe that that was that decision of Maduro of taking people into jail because yeah. not respecting the law was necessary because uh, we were used during Chavez time because of his charisma to deal with those situations and nothing happened. And, mm -hmm. and Chavez was very indulgent, allowing those disorders to happen and but in the case of Maduro, I believe that because he knows that he's not Chavez and he doesn't have Chavez charisma, he, yeah. the, his strategy was, you know, I, I need to impose the rule of law here because if I allow these vandals to get control of the country, we're going to lose control actually yeah. of the country. Yeah. So I believe that the approach of applying the rule of law was excellent during those days. But the bad thing is that they portray us like violators so, of human rights. So we, you know, in, in our, at the university here, we talk about the American news media and uh, why does it seem like it's biased one way or biased the other mm. way at certain times. Um, so how, um, you know, what's, what, what do you think, I'm just asking for your opinion here, I mean, what do you think goes on? I mean, do you think that the, um, that someone in the president's office kind of dictates how the news will be reported? Do you think that the reporters, another theory is that, um, you know, the reporters kind of, they're all, they all have the same education, they kind of go to the same schools and they're looking at the mm. world the same way. Do you, you think it's a little bit of that? Do you, I mean, do you have, what, what theories do you have? Why, why does it look the way it is? <laughs> no one asked me about that before. Yeah. But I have think about those things. I believe that it should be like a mix of those things. I don't believe yeah. that there is someone dictated from the White yeah. House or in the case of yeah. Venezuela for, yeah. from the Miraflores Well, Palace. we know that's not the case or, you know, Nixon wouldn't have had to resign exactly. and, you know, exactly. uh, Clinton wouldn't have had the uh, the scandals he had, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, I mean so, yes, so there's no, there. we know there's no direct relationship mm -hmm. there, but mm -hmm. yet, um, it, from your point of view, I'm sure it seems clearly that there was a, kind of a unity in the way things were being reported, right? Did you see In Venezuela, any? you mean? Well, in the United States, in, how the United about, States was reporting about things. About what happened in Venezuela? Yeah, yeah. Of course, when there are events, like the ones that happened in Venezuela yeah. in 2014, yeah. then you see that they are like matrices that, in that case, I believe that might be the side from, maybe not the White House, but maybe the part of other institution here in, in the US. Yeah. But I cannot get too much into those details because well, I might get into trouble yeah. no, it's talking okay. about U.S. politics. These are these are these are big <laughs> topics in the in yes. the communication classroom. But, so but I just anyway, to I mean, in general it, yeah. terms, I believe that 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 uh, when situations like that happen, uh, I mean, media sometimes receive inputs from the yeah. uh, government agencies, whatever they are. Yeah. Not well, only one here of the, in the uh, U.S. But uh, one of the theories by um, uh, scholar uh, Robert Entman. 
um, is that reporters can only interview people who are experts. Mm -hmm. And so when you're doing a foreign policy story, there aren't a lot of people who are experts. I mean, you know, if you're doing a foreign policy story in Venezuela, you kind of have to talk to someone who, you know, was in the foreign service in some capacity in mm -hmm. Venezuela or in, oh, in South America in or Central America. And so, so there's really a limited number of people who you can interview. So even though the reporter might want to go off in a different direction, it's hard for that reporter to find yes. a source, you know, who did at some point work for the, um, you know, diplomatic wing of the, uh, you know, that um, of the government. So, th so that's, you know, that's, that, that's one of my uh, uh, favorite theories. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <clears throat> Uh, just, uh, just for a, a little bit at the end here, I mean, since you are the, uh, the consulate in Chicago, mm. uh, can you tell us briefly what, what connections does Chicago have with Venezuela? Why is Chicago important? Yes, I, mm. I, that's a good question mm. because I, uh, I believe that, uh, I mean, Chicago is uh, one of the most important cities in the U.S., and I believe that because of that, we have presence in Chicago since the 40s or 50s. Really? Yes, so the Venezuelan consulate in Chicago has been here at least since the 50s, 1950, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I mean, but for me, if you ask me, and we have had those discussions with our foreign service in Venezuela, I mean, uh, there are other cities that are more important for Venezuela than Chicago. I mean, in terms well, of bilateral relations, yes. commercial, trade, yeah, yeah. Uh, cultural, and New York, uh, Miami, yeah. uh, uh, San Juan of, in Puerto Rico are, are like places that are more connected up to Venezuela sure. than Chicago. So in our community here is small. We have a community that is like no bigger than Chicago that five or eight thousand Venezuelans, so we don't have a big community yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah, Chicago's, I guess, uh, at one point was the second largest Polish city in the world, yes. so you're not, uh, yes. you're not, you're not uh, competing. And, and with I believe that at some point <laughs> trade happened yeah. a lot between Chicago and Venezuela, and that's why we opened yeah. uh, during the 50s uh, our consular office here. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all the time we have for our program. Thank you uh, to um, uh, Jesus Rodriguez for joining me today um, on the Calumet Roundtable. I'm your host, Tom Roach. Have a great day.